lot of big breaking news tonight. Lawyers for Covington High School student Nicholas Sandman, they have just filed, and I have read, a $250 million lawsuit against the Washington Post. Also, breaking news surrounding lying Andrew McCabe. We have a special Hannity investigation into Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, and that's all coming up. But we do start tonight with the very latest on Empire actor Jesse Smollett. He claimed that two late-night pro-Trump racist tied a noose around his neck, doused him in a chemical, all while shouting racist and homophobic slurs. But now the actor has lawyered up. He's now refusing to meet with police as multiple outlets now reporting that Smollett paid two acquaintances to stage the alleged assault and they even rehearsed it. Those two men are now reportedly cooperating with investigators and Smollett, he appears to be in big, big trouble. Now in the state of Illinois, filing a false police report, that's a felony punishable by up to three years in prison. And remember the threatening racist letter filled with white substance. If there's any chance that Smollett received that prior to the attack, that there are reports, maybe the FBI is investigating if he might have been involved in that. If that happened, if he's responsible, well, he could also face federal felony charges. We're going to have a report from Illinois in just a moment. But first, on this show, we tell you, we wait for the investigation to play out. We keep you posted with all the facts as they come in, are available. We don't rush to judgment, nor do we deny people the presumption of innocence. And that goes for Jesse Smollett. If his claims turn out to be a complete hoax, it would just be one in a long list of fake, phony, concocted, MAGA-inspired hate crimes in the Trump era. So why is this happening? Now, it's pretty simple. Deranged attention seekers on the left, they know exactly how to extract sympathy from Hollywood and the media just play their preferred narrative. Play right into it. Now, for most members of the hate Trump media, we the people, remember, we're the enemy. They believe that anybody who supports Trump, his agenda, as successful as it's been, we're scary, we're uneducated, we're racist, sexist, xenophobic, homophobic, Islamophobic monsters, and smelly Walmart people. The media really should get out of New York City and Washington, D.C., and L.A. and San Francisco just a little more, because this lie could not be further from the truth. And it's said every two and four years. Now, according to World Values Survey, look at this. The United States ranks among the single most tolerant nations in the world. Americans have led the way in charitable giving, the president's sweeping prison reform, giving nonviolent offenders a second chance, widely supported among Trump supporters. This is the greatest, single best, kindest country on the face of the earth. We're the most generous people. The average American, we are inherently good people. But sadly, that doesn't quite fit the left's narrative. So they're always literally willing and ready and able to jump on any story, regardless of red flags, regardless of evidence, to paint any Trump supporters as evil and scary. And we've got the tape, and we'll show it to you. Take a look. Certainly, there are many indications of a hate crime here. They are looking for two suspects who were apparently wearing Make America Great Again hats. It's coming from the President of the United States. He's dog whistling every day. He's separating and dividing. Connect the dots. This is what happens. If you are in a position of power and you hate people and you want to cause suffering to them. My initial reaction was sadness. Yeah. I wasn't shocked. This obsession, this rush to paint a huge sector of the American population as racist, evil, pretty widespread. Democratic presidential candidates Cory Booker, Kamala Harris, well, they called the Smollett case, without any evidence, a modern-day lynching. GQ runs the headline, quote, the racist, homophobic attack on Jesse Smollett is far-right America's endgame. Look at Newsbusters, ABC, CBS, NBC News spent a whopping 157 minutes covering the Smollett case from one perspective. Meanwhile, the same networks, they only spent 24 minutes covering, well, an actual hate crime in 2017 when a young man who happened to be white was kidnapped and tortured by a group of teens shouting anti-white, anti-Trump slurs. Those assailants actually filmed the attack, posted it to Facebook, and were charged with actual hate crimes. And the media cared more about Smollett and his too-good-to-be-true narrative 
and it's why you rarely see any outrage over what is now a sharp rise, for example, of anti-Semitic attacks in de Blasio's New York, Comrade de Blasio, because those attacks weren't carried out by Trump supporters with red hats that say, make America great again, not a concern of the left. Like this brutal attack caught on video. You can see there a Jewish man savagely beaten, allegedly because of his faith, his religion, his ethnicity. Where's the outrage over this real hate crime? And let's not forget about all the attacks on Trump supporters simply because of their political beliefs. Earlier this month in Kentucky, a man reportedly pulled a gun on a couple for wearing a Make America Great Again hat. What is the obsession with the hats? Two days ago, a van shoe store employee launched into a graphic tirade against the teen because he was wearing a Make America Great Again hat. The employee has since been fired. And on Monday, a person reportedly called a seven-year-old kid, little Hitler. Why? Because he had a hot chocolate stand that was raising money to protect the country for a border wall. All of this happened in February. And we're not even halfway through the month. So ask yourself, why are people likely to get assaulted or accosted in the streets because they wear a hat that says they want to make their country great? But according to the left, we're evil, we're bad, we're hateful. Now, this is nothing new for the left. It's an age-old tactic. We can go back to Richard Jewell, the Duke lacrosse case, Ferguson, Missouri, Baltimore, UVA. More recently, Judge Kavanaugh. And more really recently, the Covington High School kid. Rushing to judgment is the left's M.O., and the media as well. No due process, no presumption of innocence. Now, breaking tonight, there are about to be real consequences for those who report fake news, slander, and libel innocent people. Lynn Wood, he is the attorney that previously represented Richard Jewell in his defamation case, by the way, won a lot. He filed tonight a $250 million suit against the Washington Post on behalf of Nicholas Sandman. Remember, Sandman was the young teen at the center of the media's fake outrage, lies, smears, slander, his lawful and completely normal conduct at a protest where he was attacked verbally and otherwise. He calmly, as you can see, he stood his ground, he smiled, and when a 64-year-old Native American activist walked over, approached him with his drum in his face and kind of speaking loudly. This after a horrible, vicious, racist, verbal assault against these kids by the activists that are known as the Black Hebrew Israelites. Watch this. This is the religion of America. That's make America great again. A bunch of child molesters. That's right. Just like your damn Donald Trump. That's, dude, look at all these dusty crackers with that racist garbage on. Look at these dirty crackers. These kids are 15, 16 years old. And despite what you just saw, still members of the media, like the Washington Post and NBC and others. By the way, you guys wait. I know Lynn Wood. Lynn Wood is one of the greatest attorneys in the country. He'll be here tomorrow night. You guys are in for a fight. Uh, vilified, an innocent high school student. And according to the suit, we have an early copy of it. It says, quote, the Washington Post wanted to lead the charge against this child because he was a pawn in its political war against political adversaries. A war so disconnected and beyond the comprehension of a 16-year-old, Nicholas in this case, that it might as well have been science fiction. Now, the suit against the Post says the Post must be dealt with the same way every bully is dealt with, and that is hold the bully fully accountable for its wrongdoing in a manner which effectively deters the bully from, again, bullying other children. In a civil suit, punishment and deterrence is found in awarding money damages to the victim and target of the bully. In order to fully compensate Nicholas for his damages and to punish, deter, and teach the Washington Post a lesson it will never forget, this action seeks money damages in excess of $250 million. By the way, this amount Jeff Bezos, the world's richest person, paid in cash for the Washington Post when his company, Nash Holdings, purchased the newspaper in 2013. Finally, there's going to be justice. And the good news about this is this, this happens daily with this hate Trump media, this corrupt media, this rush to judgment, no presumption of innocence. It would have taken them five minutes to get this story right. They will now be held accountable. 
Washington Post responded to the lawsuit tonight and emailed to Fox News, writing, quote, we are reviewing a copy of the lawsuit and we plan to mount a vigorous defense. My money is on Nicholas and Lynn Wood. Now, tonight, the hate Trump media, Hollywood, Democrats, they once again, they look foolish, they look stupid. They loudly and constantly claim to repudiate bullying of any kind. At the end of the day, the real bullies aren't wearing Make America Great Again hats. And tonight, the real bullies, they will be held accountable. Mark my words, Bezos, is, he's going to pay. Because according to Lynn Wood, this is only the tip of the iceberg. NBC, CNN, stay tuned, coming attraction. Lynn Wood, by the way, will be here tomorrow for an exclusive interview. But first, joining us now with the very latest on the Smollett case, Fox 32 reporter Raffer Weigel is with us. Uh, Raffer, good to see you. You have been in the forefront of breaking a lot of these stories, skeptical at first, unlike a lot of the national media. And I got to give you a lot of credit for that because uh, there's been some horrific reporting in this case. Well, uh, thank you, Sean, and I, I, I apologize to have to do this on your show. The name is Rafer. Uh, since this might be one of the only times I'm on your show, I figured I might want really? to give I've my not, name Here right. I say but something yes. nice, and you got to take a... No, Rafer, I'm sorry. I know, man. I'm sorry. I apologize. You said something nice to me, and it, I was biting I know, my tongue on that one. I know, and then you just hit me right in the well, back you know, of the head. I, I'm a great guy. We're getting along I, great. I, I, no, I, I figured kidding. you could Don't respect the, uh, the truth in my reporting. Um, but no, you're absolutely right. Very early on with this case, uh, Sean, I was very skeptical because Chicago police were skeptical. You know, we were very careful at Fox 32 News to report that Jesse Smollett says he was attacked because we weren't there. We don't know if he was attacked. And, you know, normally I defend my profession, but yes, the national media that ran with the headline, Jesse Smollett was attacked. That's journalism 101. I mean, it's the old adage, if your mother says she loves you, check it out. Police also told me that they were very skeptical given the nature of this, the, the red hats, the bleach, the rope, and the location in Streeterville. I voiced that skepticism publicly on Twitter. I did get some backlash, and now it appears that there might be uh, some merit to that skepticism. As for the very latest on the case right now, the very latest is the, this is the big news now. State's Attorney Kim Fox, a Democrat, announcing that she has recused herself from this case. I can tell you that this blindsided Chicago police. She just released a statement a moment ago basically saying that out of impartial, impartiality that uh, there could have been, uh, that they had, uh, let me get this right here, that... Um, they wanted to address questions of impartiality based upon familiarity with potential witnesses in this case. So this means that Assistant State's Attorney Joseph Maggots is taking over the case. Today, the two Nigerian brothers went before police and prosecutors at 26th and Cal, the Cook County Courthouse. They were completely brought in in total secrecy. We had every single uh, entrance and exit staked out. We did not see these guys go in and out. The last time somebody was afforded that kind of privilege with police and prosecutors was when Oprah Winfrey went there for jury duty. Um, I did see their, lawyer, see their lawyer, Gloria Schmidt. She walked out of a doorway marked grand jury. I asked her, did her clients go before a grand jury? She simply said, I have no comment. Police then said, no, the men did not testify before a grand jury today, but they are cooperating with police, and they are right now trying to help the police build a case against Jesse Smollett. In the meantime, while all of this is going on, there is a separate investigation altogether. Mind you, the hate letter that was sent to the Empire Studios. That's being handled by the FBI and the, uh, the U.S. Postal Service, the feds. We have no idea where that investigation stands. We've been getting some leaks out of Chicago PD. But that is a whole host of potential trouble for uh, Smollett because now you're looking at federal charges, possibly linked to, to terrorism, completely independent of what might happen with the Chicago PD's case against him. Rayford, let me ask you a question here. Uh, the, the Cook County State's Attorney Kim Fox's recusal. Uh, somebody sent me, and I don't know if you know the truth of this, and I'm asking, do you know that she has endorsed Kamala Harris? I'm excited she ran for, is running for president. I would not be where I am today without her guidance, et cetera. Does any of this have to do with politics, presidential politics? Well, it, it could be politics, but it really could be something as simple as she knows Jesse Smollett. If she knows Kamala Harris, as you know, Smollett has uh, campaigned with Harris. You know, Kim Fox, it's no secret, has aspirations of higher office. And perhaps she didn't want to deal with any sort of political ramifications if she has to be the one to send Jesse Smollett well, to jail. maybe she just did the right Ultimately, thing. I, I mean, think maybe she just saw a potential conflict and got out, which uh, might be admirable. And that's absolutely a possibility as well. Her assistant, Joseph Maggots, I do not know him personally, but I know that he's going to uh, competently, ha uh, you know, handle this case and try to prosecute Smollett to the full letter of the law if they find enough evidence for him uh, to be guilty.
All right, Ray, for um, welcome your first and last appearance on Fox, but attacking. No, I'm teasing. <laughs> uh, great, great job. Thank you. Great reporting all throughout this. We appreciate you being with us. Joining us now with more is Fox News correspondent at large, Geraldo Rivera, and the host of the CBS show, Whistleblower, Judge Alex Ferreira is with us. Good to see you both. Geraldo, I begin with you. Good to be with the you. media, Geraldo, you have watched this over the years. You know, Lynn Wood's lawsuit will be devastating to these, to the, not only, you know, like the Washington Post and media companies, it will be devastating to big Hollywood stars. He is an unrelenting, he is a tough, tough attorney, and I'm glad Nicholas and his parents hired this guy. Well, first of all, Sean, I hope this isn't my last appearance. Uh, you pronounce my name uh, pretty accurately on a regular basis oh, since I'll we've just... only known each other 18 years. <laughs> yeah, uh, listen, first day on the show, hey, Hannity, you suck. You said my name wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and they really, the cojones, they call that. Uh, uh, so, uh, Sean, listen, first on the Smollett case, this guy played us. Race is... Race and racism and politics are inextricably interwoven, as you know. It's not an accident that uh, Trump is labeled a racist on a regular basis. Uh, you know, uh, African Americans tend to gravitate toward the Democratic Party in huge <laughs> numbers. Uh, a charge like this uh, was so incendiary, it caught on uh, because it was, uh, you know, kind of justifying and reaffirming the stereotype that people had. Oh, a poor uh, black actor, gay guy gets mugged by MAGA hats and the and the whole scenario with the noose and the bleach and uh, you know uh, and invoking the president's name. It was just. I mean, it was so patently obvious, and yet, uh, because it is so toxic, racism, and because we, we want justice in this country, we want people to have a fair shake, we bought this guy's uh, unbelievable tale. Uh, now it's coming apart but at the Geraldo, seams, and now look people at all are the cases. being embarrassed. They, they, they fall for obvious hoaxes, but, you know, they ignore all... Why is everyone getting attacked for wearing a Make America Great Again hat? Let me just, I cover Tawana Brawley, Sean, the, the, so the, mother, of, the mother of all race fake uh, cases. Tawana Brawley, to remind people, a 15-year-old upstate New York uh, went missing for four days when she surfaced. She was uh, filthy, smeared with feces and the graffiti written on her, uh, the N-word and this and that and the other thing. She said that she had been raped. Uh, not only kidnapped, but raped by a group of six uh, white men, including a cop and a, and, a, and a prosecutor. Turned out the whole thing was fake, that she did it to, uh, you know, to cover up on her own runaway uh, behavior from her family. Uh, you know, the people went for it because, uh, oh, my God, it's the worst, uh, uh, you know, example of stereotypical racism in our racist country. Uh, and then the advocates jumped on board. And once they invested in her story, they were kind of stuck with it. Uh, Al Sharpton, who I, you know, I knew very well at the time, I, I was actually subpoenaed to be his character witness in that uh, case wow. when he was sued for defamation. Uh, you know, but you, you ask, why do we believe these stories? Racism is real. Look at uh, what happened in Charleston. Agree, you assigned me to the church way. massacre. Geraldo, admit, That's you know, a real story. I gave all these examples. It seems to go one way. Let me bring the judge in. Judge, good to see you. Welcome back. Um, let, let's good talk about the legal yourself. side of this. From your perspective, all the time, all the effort, all the police resources, there's a lot in play here. This is not a small deal if he, in fact, these witnesses cooperating or telling the truth. Absolutely. This is going to be a big problem for him because... Uh, under, under Illinois law, making a false police report falls under the disorderly conduct statute, and it's a class four felony, which, as you pointed out, exposes him to up to between one and three years in prison. What's going to be uh, the deciding factor in that is, first of all, how much resource did he pull away? Chicago is not a town that can just afford to throw detectives in every direction. They're buried in crime over there. On top of that, there's an uh, indication that he may have been charged, criminally charged and, and convicted of making false statements to the police wow. before. Those things don't weigh in his favor. If those are true, I can see a judge coming down on him very hard if it turns out that these allegations are true. On top of that, if the mail fraud investigation, or it's not typically used as mail fraud because that requires usually a purchase of products, or lying to a federal officer, as we've seen in many recent political cases, they take that stuff seriously. If that bears fruit, then you're talking about up to five years in prison. So 
he's not he's not in a very light situation right now if this turns out to be the fraud that it's looking like it is and and the red flags that came up at the beginning were clear to police officers I, I assure you they were clear I don't I, know why I, journalists I had people warning me on day one be careful you know I happen to have really good friends thankfully in Chicago last 30 seconds Geraldo I, I think that this guy really should get his just desserts he played us uh, like a fiddle, and all the politicians who are not unequivocally condemning him now, uh, shame on them, Sean. All right, thank you both. Uh, when we come back, Sarah Carter, big breaking news report you'll want to hear next. Also, John Solomon. Later on, Laura Trump will respond to the very vicious, nasty comments Bernie Sanders made about the president today. And on top of all of that, a big announcement at the end of the show. All right, time for our Hannity Watch on the Deep State tonight. Liar, leaker, Andrew McCabe, who served as James Comey's right-hand man for years at the very center of the FBI's witch hunt into Trump-Russia collusion, who, by the way, is under criminal investigation along with others. On March 16, 2018, fired, lying, leaking, multiple times, under oath. Just read the DOJ Inspector General's report. McCabe is mentioned a whopping 800 times and not in a good way. The report noted McCabe lacked candor. That means he lied and referred McCabe to the U.S. attorney for consideration of criminal charges, along with others. As we speak, he's currently facing that criminal investigation, likely over perjury charges and unauthorized leaks to the press. And now he's out hawking a new book, trying to rewrite history with numerous public appearances, only friendly outlets, all while jumping through hoops to avoid the facts about his difficult relationship with the truth. Take a look. I'm not convinced this isn't just some kind of PR campaign to stop yourself from getting indicted. Mm -hmm. You were fired at the recommendation of the FBI, which in your book you cite four times how great of an organization it is for your lack of candor. I would like you to say right here on national TV that you were not a source for the New York Times, you were never a source for the New York Times or any other publication, considering that's what you're accused of lying about. Basically, I'm, were you ever a leaker to the New York Times? Absolutely not. No, not, not in any time ever. Why did James Comey deny the claim that he approved your leaks to the press? I don't know why Jim Comey doesn't remember the conversations that we had in the same way that I do. Pretty disgraceful. Now, so while he throws his longtime friend and buddy and colleague, the ever so honorable James Comey, under the bus, and he's not so honorable, he had nothing but praise for FBI lovebirds, Strzok and Page. Take a look. Lisa Page and Pete Strzok are good people who served this country well. They made some poor decisions in their private lives and in terms of the communications they exchanged with each other. That's brought incredible grief and scrutiny on the FBI. I'm sure they regret that, but good people make bad decisions every day. Good people serving the country well? You mean when the supposedly nonpartisan, uh, high-ranking FBI officials talking about opening an investigation into Trump as an insurance policy? Oh, with him. In order to literally destroy his presidency, undo a duly elected president, struck calling the president an idiot, abysmal, Lisa Page calling Trump loathsome and awful, and struck saying that Hillary Clinton should win the election in 2016, 100 million to zero. Zero. It's probably why he rigged the investigation and covered up the crimes we know she committed. What about when they called Donald Trump an enormous bleep, a bleeping idiot? Worse. And let's not forget when Strzok texted that he could smell Trump supporters, us, in a Walmart in Southern Virginia. These two were harboring aggressive, sick, obsessive, compulsive, pro-Clinton, anti-Trump feelings, all while clearing Hillary Clinton of obvious crimes, which we have highlighted over and over again on this show. And then they actively participated in the insurance policy, witch hunt against the president, even serving in Mueller's investigation, like all the other Clinton sycophants and Democratic donors. Their text came to light, leading to the termination of Strzok and forcing Page to resign in shame. Joining us now with a lot more, Fox News contributor Sarah Carter from The Hill, John Solomon. I, besides, I'm going to get to Rosenstein, and, and we're going to get to wearing a wire, and we're going to get to the to what obviously happened in the case of 
the FISA warrant court application, FISA judges being lied to repeatedly. They sign off on it. They were warned it's not verified. They were warned it's likely lies. They were warned Hillary Clinton paid for it. They were warned Steele hates Trump. But, you know, it was two years ago this March, right here on this program, that both of you, John Solomon and Sarah Carter, broke the story about the abuse of intelligence gathering and unmasking and, and so on and so forth. Sarah, you just had an update on this today, and you're saying that still the Office of Director of National Intelligence and the NSA won't let Republican lawmakers see how many people were unmasked. Why are they covering that up? I think this is stunning, Sean. I mean, all we have to do is go back to, like you said, more than two years ago when these stories started coming out. And now what I discovered, uh, Representative David Nunez uh, told me when I asked him what's going on with this investigation, he said, well, we were promised a year ago and the president ordered the director of national intelligence as well as the national security agency to set up a repository. This is a, a classified setting where they can go through these highly classified documents that basically unmasked Americans, and we're still waiting. They have not given us access to it, despite the fact that they told the lawmakers more than a year ago that they would do it immediately. And they have just stymied them and stymied them, so they have not been able to review these unmaskings. Remember Samantha Powers, the U.N. ambassador at Wasn't the time? was a 350 she... percent increase in surveillance of masking, leaking raw intelligence, by the way, a crime that was committed even against General Flynn? Absolutely, there was, and and we and then we found enormous amounts of unmasking that was that was done by the UN ambassador, and then she even said herself during a hearing to Trey Gowdy that she didn't sign off on all those requests. So not only were there unmaskings, but potentially people were signing off on people's names to unmask Americans. All right, let me to go unmask to the, the Americans. Oh yeah, I, it, well that would be abuse of power, just like every other instance of abuse of power, including lying to FISA court judges. Uh, Victor Davis Hanson, really brilliant writer, has a great article in detail. Don't have time to go through it. Autopsy of a dead coup and how it's failed. And John Solomon, your paper, The Hill, Mueller interviewed McCabe in search of Russia Gate dirt. Well, first of all, we know his pit bull Andrew Weissman was briefed by Bruce Orr in August of That's 2016. Right. And number two, we know that Bruce Orr was funneling information from Christopher Steele long after Steele right. was fired for lying and leaking by the FBI to the special counsel's office. Does that mean the dossier that Hillary paid for with Russian lies, did that become the roadmap for this witch hunt? It certainly was one of the roadmaps. Uh, tomorrow I'm going to report that there was a third dossier. Remember, we know about the Steele dossier. We know about the Blumenthal uh, dossier that was sent to the State Department, forwarded to the FBI. Tomorrow, I'm going to report there was a third dossier put together and given to the Justice Department using Fusion GPS materials. And when you hear who wrote it, who gave it to the Justice oh, Department, oh, oh, oh. and who knew about it, you're going to love this. After two years of us being yep. together, you're now going to not tell me, and you know who wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you're uh, yep. not going to. And you have Absolutely. the story locked down. I right. do indeed. Yeah, I'll give you a little hint. Let's let's assume that in the Bruce Orr family, getting stuff to the FBI was a family ding, business. Ding, ding. And that should be it. All right. Yeah. Uh, message sent and received. Thank you. Um, all right. <laughs> let me let me go to what we have here. And everybody that I know that li knows William Barr says straight arrow. William Barr is going to do his job. If he does his job, Sarah, he has to go back to Hillary. He has to go back to a rigged investigation. He has to go back to the crime she committed. He has to go to the FISA uh, that everybody was warned about, the dossier, what lies were told the, the FISA judges, correct? Correct. And, Sean, there is nobody else to actually have an investigation conducted on any of this but William Barr. Remember, the final say is going to be the Department of Justice. Congress can only do so much. But without the Department of Justice actually opening up an investigation without William Barr, all of this goes nowhere. We absolutely right. have to have an investigation. So, John, you're going to blow this story wide open tomorrow. Um, yes, sir. Both of you, and I'll ask John first, do you believe now that things are closing in on those deep state people that tried to rig a presidential election and undo uh, a duly elected president using breaking the law and doing nefarious things and illegal things. John. I do believe that the truth is finally coming about, about how a small group of people at the top of the justice and FBI 
uh, Department of Justice and FBI tried to uh, undo what the American voters did and do it in ways that were in violation of the laws and regulations they were supposed to uh, adhere to. Last word, sir. Sean. What we're seeing was a silent coup, and if the D Department of Justice doesn't open an investigation into this, then it will be a disservice to the American people. Uh, we, no, it's even worse than that. It will be a shredding of the Constitution and Absolutely. the end of the rule of law as we know it, and due process and equal justice and application of our laws. I, I hope the new Attorney General understands how significant and serious this all is. Go back to the beginning. It's got to start there. Thank you both. Look forward to that report tomorrow. All right, when we come back, a mini monologue. The Democrats move towards socialism and how it literally endangers every American citizen. Also, Laura Trump is here to react to that and Bernie Sanders' atrocious remarks about the president and a big Hannity announcement as we continue. So I've been telling you an extreme, radical, new far left wing is taking over the Democratic Socialist Party, pushing an agenda based on, let's see, higher taxes like 70 percent top rates, a wealth tax after you've been taxed, basically legalizing government stealing after you paid all your taxes and more government control over pretty much every aspect of your life, nationalizing industry. And just today. Crazy Bernie Sanders threw his hat into the ring, promising even more far-left, extreme, radical socialism. Take a look. What's going to be different this time? We're going to win. We are going to also launch what I think is unprecedented uh, in modern American history, and that is a grassroots movement, John, to lay the groundwork for transforming the economic and political life of this country. That's what's different. We have a president who is a racist, who is a sexist, who is a xenophobe, who is doing what no president in our lifetimes has come close to doing, and that is trying to divide us up. But all of your... All right, we all know Bernie's nuts and a socialist. The problem is his ideas are gaining a foothold as like the majority of the Democratic Socialist Party. Look no further than... Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez, who worked as an organizer for Bernie back in 2016, pushing hard for his crazy ideas like the job-killing Green New Deal, Medicare for all, $33 billion. And just look at her latest comments about border security. Take a look. No matter how you feel about, a, about the wall, you know, I think it's a moral abomination. I think it's like the Berlin Wall. Uh, Congresswoman, the Berlin Wall served a much different purpose. You see, they were keeping East German citizens in the country because they wanted to escape the tyranny of that country. Just the opposite. Now, so far, Senator Sanders and the Congresswoman are relying on platitudes and bumper stickers and everything's free, free, free to sell their ideas, guaranteeing the end, by the way, of the U.S. as we know it. Here are the specifics. Cost of Bernie's government-run health care plan, $33 trillion in 10 years. Ocasio-Cortez, get us all fossil fuel, the all-natural gas, only green energy. That's going to cost trillions and trillions. And remember, you've got to take these seriously because, what, we have 100 Democrats supporting us and other major 2020, candidate, 2020 candidates, Kamala Harris, Spartacus Booker, on board with these loony ideas, even though they're desperately trying hard to avoid the socialist label when that's what they're endorsing. Is it starting to make sense? So why are these far-left radicals, why do they want to hide the cost? Why do they want to cloak their comments in vague, lofty rhetoric, take free houses and free health care and free college and, by the way, healthy government food that's guaranteed and no monopolies, the takeover of industry, promises that are supposed to take away all of your fears in life? How did it work out with keep your doctor, keep your plan and save money? Joining us now, senior advisor to Donald J. Trump for president 2020, Laura Trump is with us. I know you're used to the attacks. More importantly, free health care, free housing. Oh, and Elizabeth Warren wants free daycare. Uh, we're going to have guaranteed healthy food, guaranteed pretty vacations, medical leave, all of that, even if you're unwilling to work. 
Yeah, well, it's it's all so crazy, Sean. And what I think people need to realize when we're talking about socialism, it is essentially the government taking over, as you're explaining, almost every aspect of your life. And in America, that is not right. That is not who we are as a country. That's not what our country was founded on. These things are becoming incredibly mainstream within the Democrat Party. And it's going to be very hard for people to distance themselves from these come the 2020 election. I tend to think... Let them keep digging themselves in a hole because the, the average American in this country, I think, sees how crazy these ideas are and how quickly this would bankrupt our country and lead us down a path much like Venezuela is right now, where, Sean, they're eating dog and cat food to survive. You see that they don't even have beds in their hospitals. They're in deplorable conditions. People are starving to death. That is not something that we want to see happen in the United States of America. People have to take socialism and anyone's running on a socialist platform incredibly seriously. How, how are they going to convince Americans that we're going to eliminate all fossil fuels, the cars we love to drive, the lifeblood of our economy? Every American's going to have to retrofit and remodel their home. Oh, cows are going away, no <laughs> airplanes, and we're going to, what, have sailboats to Europe and high-speed trains to Australia New Zealand? It makes absolutely no sense. And when you actually get, get down to it and start to ask questions like this, I think oftentimes they really can't answer you. They say, well, we'll find the money for it. Well, who's paying for it, Sean? The reality is they want to tax 70 to 90 percent taxes on the American citizens. Think about that, what that would mean for everyone across this country. It is so crazy. It's never well, going to happen in this that. country. I think what's happening, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Illinois, California. California lost a million people. They left the state. 13,000 businesses left the state in less than 10 years. Um, so they're all losing... They're all losing people in their states because they're leaving, Absolutely. because of high taxes and burdens of regulation. If they do it nationwide, what do you think those people that have money are going to do? They're going to move their money they're and they're going to move country. themselves. You got that right. Everybody in New York is moving to Florida. And guess what? If they try to do it in this country, people are moving out of the country. It is going to spell disaster. Absolutely. Yeah, pretty scary. All right, Laura Trump, great to see you. Congrats on the baby. I hear the baby's uh, running around, jumping all Climbing over Climbing on the sofa, he's into everything. I know. The first walking stage is step, step, boom. <laughs> yeah. Scary. Uh, all right, good to see you. Still Thank to you. come. An exclusive interview. John James, apparently, reportedly, being considered for the U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. and Congressman Steve Scalise in a huge programming announcement. You don't want to miss. Straight ahead. The Democrats want you to believe it's a manufactured crisis, but we have disturbing news. Mexican immigration officials say they have now deported 25 MS-13 gang members who are traveling with the migrant caravan to the U.S. Here now with reaction to discuss the swirling rumors that President Trump may tap him to be the next ambassador to the U.N., former U.S. Senate candidate in Michigan, who I wanted to win, endorsed to win, which probably killed any chance he had to win, John James and House Minority Whip. Congressman Steve Scalise, uh, any truth to the rumors? Uh, any truth to the rumors about uh, the about potential you. for uh, the U.S. Yes. ambassadorship? Um, you know, I have not been in direct contact with the White House, but it's a tremendous honor to be considered. And I was just listening to your last segment, Sean, and uh, Bernie Sanders jumping in the race is uh, absolutely uh, hilarious. Uh, he has called our president racist, sexist, xenophobic, when our president is considered, among the people for this job, a black man, a woman, and an openly gay uh, person for the role to represent the United States on the floor of the General Assembly. Well, I'm somebody who uh, represents more than just my race. I'm somebody who represents the United States of America, who's a combat veteran and is willing to defend this nation and keeping this country first and making sure we advocate for what's best for this country uh, in New York and around the world. I'm looking forward to it. I'm extremely honored to be considered for the post, and I'm looking forward to serving my country again honorably. Steve Scalise, 25 MS-13 gang members just deported. We have ICE haters. This is this week alone, invading, defacing images of fallen heroes. Uh, 
uh, at a museum. Border apprehensions nearly double what they were last year as everyone tries to get in quickly before the wall is built. Feds busted a massive Mexican drug cartel operation in North Carolina. And Beto and company, they want to tear down that border wall. Your reaction? Well, Sean, first of all, anybody who tries to claim it's a manufactured crisis ought to first go out and apologize to every one of those angel moms, the, the parents who have lost loved ones. Look, in my own uh, part of South Louisiana, uh, we had Spencer Chauvin, who was a hero, a firefighter, who was killed by somebody here illegally. Sean, just Friday, in South Louisiana, uh, there was a person who was here in the country illegally convicted of molesting a child who was deported in 2016 because of that felony, got back into the country illegally again. Who knows how many more crimes he committed? They just captured him Friday. Uh, we have a serious crisis at our border. You can't have such an open border where you literally have people who were deported for being child molesters that are able to come right back into this country unchecked, and Democrats are okay with that and call it a manufactured well, I, well, crisis. Well, I don't think... I, I, it's funny, because there's 4,000... Homicides in a in two-year two period, 30,000 sex assault, John James, in a, in a two-year period, 100,000 violent assaults. Oh, well, by the way, Nancy Pelosi is saying, no, ICE will not be alerted if illegals fail gun background checks. Okay. Well, you know, well, that makes a lot of sense. Well, you know, I, I absolutely support securing our borders, and I think that uh, we need to make sure we give ICE and our Border Patrol and, and security personnel all the resources they need. Look, you can't control every variable, but you better doggone well control the variables that you can. And if you can do more to secure our border, if you can do more to keep our families safe, our president's number one job, his number one job is to enforce the laws of this country and to keep Americans safe. And I don't see it as controversial for our president to finally keep his promises that other presidents have made to secure our borders and keep Americans safe. Our president is actually doing it. So yeah. I don't find it controversial to keep Americans safe, and I'm, I'm looking forward to, to doing everything I can to do How that. How is it uh, possible, though, between cartels, gangs, 90 percent of heroin, uh, Steve Scalise, uh, fentanyl, the homicides I mentioned, the sexual assaults I mentioned, the violent assaults I mentioned, angel moms and dads, how is it possible they could even suggest manufactured? Well, you know, this has become a real problem for the Democrat Party when you see this denial. Look, the Americans across the board believe in national security and border security. They know what's going on. They know that President Trump said that he's going to secure our border, and he's following through on that promise, and frankly, he's going to be rewarded by it. And any of these open border Democrats, I hope they continue to push back because it shows the divide. President right, Trump's have... working to keep our country safe. Thank you both. And uh, John James, I hope there is a position for you in the administration. That'd be great. Uh, when we come back, our villain of the day, one of the most deranged commentators in fake news, we've got the tape, and my big announcement. I'm pretty happy about this. Well, some parts of it, straight ahead. Love that animation. All right, our villain of the day, frequent guest on fake news CNN. Take a look. I think the, the, the correct term is not treasonous, but patriotic. I mean, they are thinking about the national security of the United States. Uh, one of the dumbest lawyers in the country. All right, now to your mail. Arnold wrote on Twitter, when you make everything free, you forget a very important point. Who the hell's paying for it? It's a great question. Gary writes, I sure hope the damn 2020 hopefuls are not flying around the country in big airplanes, creating a big carbon footprint, dirtying my air while on the campaign trail. They should take one of those high-speed trains. All right, our big announcement time. All right, starting on Monday, we will be broadcasting live from Vietnam ahead of the historic second summit between the president and North Korea's Kim Jong-un. I will also have an interview with the president after they meet, an exclusive interview. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have left. We are not the Destroy Trump media. But let not your heart be troubled. The news continues. Laura Ingram is in the swamp. 